Well, good morning. My name is Dan. I'm with the media team here at French Church, and I am so excited, so excited to welcome you to French Church Online. If you're new to Friends, if you can, I would love to direct you to our website at chfriends.church. There's a tab on that screen called I'm New. Click on it, scroll down to the bottom, fill out our connection card, just set up some basic information, submit it to us, and then we can follow up with you and answer any questions you may have about friends. It's a great way for you to connect with us, us to connect with you, and ultimately connect with God, because that is why we're here. And I'm so thankful that you came here to, to join in with us with worship. Uh, we have a great message today from Pastor. We have some wonderful worship um, just about to get started. So let's head on in there. God bless you, church. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more Praise the Lord, His mercy is more Stronger than darkness and new every morn Our sins, they are many He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness and new every morn, our sins, they are many. of kindness he lavished on us his blood was the payment his life was the cost we stood neath the dead we could never afford our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the lord his mercy is more Paid it all, all to 
Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Amen. It seems like fear is a huge issue these days. The idea of phobias and fears and panic attacks and anxieties are just at, at the highest levels that you could even imagine. Uh, we're coming up with, with new words uh, for uh, different fears. In fact, I did a little quick little search and found some um, uh, phobias that we don't even, we probably didn't even realize existed. Uh, there's a phobia on uh, fear of getting peanut butter stuck on the, t the roof of your mouth. There's a, literally a fear. I don't remember what it was. It was probably too, uh, too long, but let me, let me share some of these fears that I discovered. One is called optophobia. You know what this is? The fear, uh, to, uh, fear of opening your eyes. And so that's what many of you suffer every morning when the alarm goes off. Uh, optophobia. You just call in and tell your boss, I'm, I'm experiencing some optophobia. Anyway, um, there, another one is poganophobia. This is the fear of beards. And, you know, fear the beard. Of course, we've all heard of that. There's all kinds of reasons why people would have this phobia. Uh, won't dissect that, but uh, it's probably because guys don't... Uh, comb and treat their, their beards very well and they're stinky and ugly. And I don't know, whatever. And then here's one that's big in our culture and our society today. It's ergophobia. It's the fear of work. Uh, when, when the big G, big daddy G is giving us stimulus checks all the time, there's a lot of people staying home from work these days and they're just afraid of work. If I go back to work, I'm not going to get my freeze, my free stuff. So anyway, it's easy to joke about fear. But fear is a serious subject. It's something we all fear. It's, I mean, uh, uh, have. It's something we all experience. And, and so I'm not trying to downplay the reality of fear and phobia. But I do want you to know the role of fear and what the Bible has to say about fear. You know, oftentimes we'll hear verses about uh, do not fear. We have verses about perfect love casts out uh, fear. And so we kind of get this idea that fear is a negative thing and we don't want it. It's not a good uh, thing to, to have. The reality is, is our culture is, is a culture of fear mongering. That's how we get people on our viewpoint on our side of the issue is, is creating these, these fearful scenarios and people are living based on certain fears. Uh, this whole COVID situation is one of those things that you just still see so many people walking around in great fear. Well, this is a serious thing. It's caused uh, a great deal of pain and suffering and many deaths. Um, it's not the kind of thing that we can truly grapple with in terms of stopping all uh, existence of this thing. It's going to be around and we cannot live in fear. And so today I want to talk about this issue of fear and get a biblical perspective of fear because the Bible actually calls us to fear. Listen to these verses in Proverbs chapter 19, verse 23. It says, the fear of the Lord leads to life. Then one rests content, untouched by trouble. It says there's a fear of the Lord that leads to life that, that causes you to be content and, and not experience trouble. It says in Proverbs 14, 27, the fear of the Lord is a life-giving fountain. I mean, both of those verses seem to be very positive about the idea of fearing the Lord. Proverbs 28, 14 says this, blessed 
or happy in some of the translations. Uh, Blessed comes from the idea of blissed out, that you were so thrilled, so happy, so joyous. Blessed is the one who fears the Lord always. But whoever hardens his heart will fall into calamity. So the Bible gives this idea that fearing God is good, but other kind of fears are bad. See, that's why I've entitled this this message, One Fear, to Rule Them All, kind of playing off the phrase that was used in Lord of the Rings about the rings and and the one ring to rule them all. Um, The way God's designed it is there's only one fear that's worth experiencing and knowing, and that is the fear of God. I'm not going to spend a lot of time trying to define that. I'll, I'll define it very quickly and easily. There's, we could spend week after week after week talking about the fear of the Lord. But um, uh, Jerry Bridges wrote this, a uh, Christian author. He said, there was a time when committed Christians were known as God-fearing people. That was a badge of honor. But somehow along the way, we lost it. Now the idea of fearing God is thought of, if thought of at all, seems like a relic from the past. Even as I talk about the fear of God, um, you may have even heard me talk about the, the word fear in that place is awe or reverence. And that so we are to fear or be in awe of God. And that is, that is part of the understanding of this. But um, I think we might throw out the the, the baby with the bathwater when we just narrowly define the fear of God as just awe. And uh, this, this idea of the fear of God, I think, is a critical theme in Scripture. Uh, it's, it's from the beginning. It is forecasted or, or prophesied of the Messiah that he was going to, to uh, live in the fear of God. And it's repeated multiple times. In fact, over 100 times we're called to fear God in Scripture. This is not something to be glossed over. It's not just an Old Testament concept or an Old Covenant concept. It's applicable to us today, the the call to fear God. One of the, the most instrumental messages that I've ever had in my life, one that, that I remember to this day, um, it's, it transformed my thinking. It transformed my heart. It, God uses it to draw me back to himself often. But it was a, a message on, called the, the Fear of God by Joy Dawson. Joy Dawson has written books and preached many messages on this subject. And uh, again, very profound. I, I can't guarantee that my message is going to do the same for you today. But, but the idea of fearing God is so critically important. Don't miss what this says. In fact, uh, Proverbs chapter 9 verse 10 says this, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. The beginning, or the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. How many of you would like to be wise? You would like to know truth. Fear of the Lord is how to get there. See, what is, what is fear? Fear comes from something more powerful than you. So we, we are fearful of those things that are greater than us or threaten us in a greater way. For instance, heights. I don't have wings. I cannot fly. Therefore, I'm afraid of dropping out of an airplane or falling off of a cliff or the top of a building or something like that. Um, so so fear is, is one of these things that says something is more powerful than you. And so when it's talking about the fear of God, it's, it's positioning us and it's aligning us into what is the most powerful thing in our universe, in our existence. You know, sometimes people see the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament as completely different. That somehow the God of the Old Testament got tired of being a judgmental and harsh ruler who ruled with an iron fist. 
And he, he instead, for the New Testament, changed into a meek and mild peacenik who wore long hair and, and maybe a sweater like Mr. Rogers. This, that's not what happened. See, God did not go, undergo a personality change. He didn't say, well, those are characteristics that are not true of me any longer. I've outgrown those characteristics. No. Um, let, me, let me explain why that's a, a very bad way to view the Old and the New Testament. Because the Old Testament was a revelation of God. It was a revelation of God. Except Christ was concealed. We can look back at the Old Testament now and see that, that Christ was being revealed, but in a shadow form and in symbolic form and uh, those kinds of things. But in the New Testament, Christ is fully revealed that God himself came and lived as a man. And so we have a more full revelation in the New Testament than we do in the Old Testament. It's not a different revelation. It's just a more full revelation. So that doesn't mean that the God of the Old Testament and his uh, uh, fearfulness is not something that we need to be concerned with. Because it is. I think the fear of the Lord is critical, especially in a day and age where fear is flaunted and used to manipulate and control people understanding the one fear that rules them all is critical. In fact, Isaiah chapter 8, verses 11 through 13, kind of talks about this, and we'll begin there. It says, The Lord spoke to me with strong hand upon me, warning me not to follow the way of this people. He said, Do not call conspiracy everything that these people call conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear, and do not dread it. The Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread, and He will be a sanctuary. It's an amazing passage because it kind of talks to us today and saying, you know, uh, God is saying this to us today too. Do not follow the way of this world, but be transformed in your thinking by the renewing of your minds. Do not follow the conspiracies and the fears of this world. There is only one to fear, and that is God alone. So what is the fear of the Lord? Let me just put it in a different phrase um, as, as kind of a foundational idea. We could go into more in depth um, in other messages, but I believe fear of, fear of the Lord or fear of God is taking God seriously. In fact, Jesus himself said this in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. He said this, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy, destroy this both soul and body in hell. See, Jesus put a different perspective on fear. He said there's really only one true fear that matters. And that fear is fearing the one who has control of our uh, eternity, our destiny. He is the one who created us and made us and designed us. See, in, in Isaiah 11, chapter 3, I mentioned this earlier, that there was a, a messianic passages, and it said that the Messiah would grow out of the stump of Jesse, and he would delight in the fear of the Lord. Jesus himself modeled that. He lived delighting himself in the fear of the Lord. And you go, how did he do that? How did Jesus delight in the fear of the Lord? Well, we'll talk about that in just a minute. But uh, fearing God is not cowering and not being, you know, like, like flinching every time God moves. It's not that kind of thing. It's, it's living with the one rule or one fear that rules them all. There's truly only one thing to fear. And that is God and how he sees you. And what his plans are for you. Those are the greatest things. Nothing in this world 
can do anything to you that God doesn't control, that God cannot stop, that God cannot hinder, and that God's actual reality of eternity is not greater than. So, fear, uh, taking God seriously is, is another way of saying the fear of God. Now, I know that's very narrow, and I'm just using that uh, as we begin this conversation. See, following Jesus and delighting in the fear of God. Following Jesus, delighting in God is what we're called to. The early church did that. The early church focused on the fear of God. It says in Acts chapter 9, verse 31, it says, Meanwhile, the church throughout Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was built up, living in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit and increased in numbers. See, here's one of the reasons why I think the church these days is is kind of powerless in many ways. We have less influence sometimes in our culture. And I think it's because many Christians, we focus on living in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. You want to come to church, you want to hear a comforting message, one that encourages you, one that reminds you of the love of God. And those are great. But that's not all there is. It says they not only lived in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, but they lived in the fear of God, which is the awe and the reverence of of a God who is to be taken seriously. He's not just an add-on to our life. We didn't just add a little religion to make our life a little bit better. We've made Jesus center of our lives. and, And that we live for an audience of one, and that is to serve Jesus and glorify Him. He is the one that controls all things, so He is the one that deserves our fear. Let's talk about lordship for a second. Um, You know, the idea of lordship conjures up in our minds different ideas. Uh, So when we say Jesus is Lord of lords, what does that mean? We get all kinds of crazy ideas. But uh, basically... A Lord is a person who owns a piece of real estate. A literally a landowner is a Lord. If you, you look at all the historical days and uh, the Lords and ladies were, were those that, that owned property, they owned real estate. And that was their kingdom. That was their domain. It was their property. And so everything on that property, including the people that lived there, were under their authority and their jurisdiction. And uh, so they were treated as well because it was a privilege to be on their property or earning money serving uh, them. And the Lord was supposed to be someone of character, of nobility, and respect. They deserved that from the people, and the people would give them uh, that. And so, we're supposed to honor and revere a king. And if we don't, uh, sometimes the king wields power and authority and a sword, and he can defeat his enemies. And so, if you do wrong to a Lord, they have a certain level of power and justice over you. See, that's a better picture of what it talks about in the Bible about Lordship, that Jesus is Lord. That's why in the early days of the church, um, why the Roman Empire really rejected the idea of Christians saying Jesus is Lord. Why they put on his cross king of the Jews. It was was a a sense of they didn't like that because um, a a lord, a king, meant that, that Jesus was a higher authority than the Roman emperors. See, they they struggled with that. It caused a great deal of conflict. See, here's the reality. People who don't have a relationship with God, or maybe they're far from God, they have a low view of God. And they have a high view of themselves. Part of what it means to come to Christ is to begin to have a high view of God and a more 
base view of ourselves that we are created beings. We are not God. God, not. And so, uh, just in thinking about this even a little bit more, let's apply that. So, there's not many lords that we're supposed to follow. There's one lord. There's not a p- balance of powers of lords. Um, you know, you don't balance power so one lord doesn't get too powerful. You don't compartmentalize uh, lordship. There's no appeal to a higher court. There's no escaping the judgment of the Lord. See, the Bible says that Jesus is the King of Kings and he's the Lord of Lords. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Um, He was not elected. He cannot be voted out. He didn't become Lord by force or by coup. Uh, He is and he was, and he always has been. So when the Bible talks about the fear of the Lord, it's because he is pre-existent. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. There's nobody that could usurp the power and the authority and the significance of God Almighty. And so the fear of the Lord is living in that kind of relationship. He's the owner of it all. We are but stewards. But he's a gracious, uh, noble, loving God who has made a way to adopt us into his own family, in his own home. The Bible says that we need to get this idea that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And so the fear of the Lord is is voluntarily doing that. It is living a life of surrender and submission to the one who controls power over our body and our soul. So how do we do this? I want to give you a a number of points on how to live in the fear of the Lord. I don't want to get bogged down in here. There's a lot of verses. I mean, there's hundreds in Scripture about... Uh, the fear of the Lord, but I, I just wanted to point out a couple things. Look at First Peter chapter one, verse seventeen, and it says this: "And if I call, uh, if you call on Him as Father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourself with fear throughout your time in exile." He's talking to a, a persecuted church that was not the home team in their community, in their world, kind of like the Christian church is today. We are in exile. This is not our permanent home. We have a home that we are going to go to. But what does Peter call the, the followers of Jesus to do? Conduct yourselves with fear, fear of God. Fearing God, loving Him because He's the best judge. He's the one that we should fear. The fear, the one fear that rules them all. If you are filled with fear, this is one of the solutions to fear. Is coming to grips with there's only one true fear that is legitimate. And that is, so what about the heights if you fall? You're saying, yeah, so what? Um, God is the one who has control of your eternity. And so um, we encounter uh, God when we fear Him. And then when we fear Him, we're driven into His Word. And when we get into His Word and we're listening to His Word and hearing from Him, we learn to fear God more. And so that, that's, that's the first point that I want to talk about is how to live in the fear of God. Love and value the Word of God. You know, I can say this in every message. In fact, I say it in in most messages. God has revealed himself through the person of Jesus Christ, and he's documented it in the word of God that we uh, call scripture and our Bible. And so we need to love and value that because uh, look what it says in Psalms 3411. It says, come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of God. God teaches us. If you listen to wisdom, if you listen to the truth of Jesus, it teaches you to fear him. In Isaiah chapter 66, verse two, these are the ones I look on with favor. God says, those who are humble and contrite in spirit and who tremble at my word. 
Those who look at God's word and tremble and say, your word is so powerful. And so amazing. And and that is the kind of person that God's favor is showered upon. And so we need to love and we need to value the word of God. We don't make up our own definitions of love. We don't make up our own definitions of hell and heaven and what it means to live on this earth. Uh, We go to the word of God and in the word of God, in our personal devotions and our applications, we, we grow in relationship to God. And so it increases our fear and respect and admiration and reverence for who God is, his holiness, his goodness, his grace, his mercy. It's not just about accumulation of knowledge. It's not just, you know, learning the, consuming the narrative story. It's not just writing in a journal. It's not just reading uh, small portions of scripture or a lot of portions of scripture. It is learning to fear God and take him seriously. So when we're in the word of God, we're taking him seriously. We're learning how to fear God. The Bible talks about uh, fear of God comes, is, is learned through obedience and listening to God. Be still and know that I am God. That is, that is learning to just quiet yourself and know that God is God and we're not. God is God and we are not. And so um, when we listen to read and understand, or we, we go to God's word and read and understand, uh, we know God better and we know ourselves better. Is that right? Okay, Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 58 says this, If you do not diligently observe all the words of this law that are written in this book, fearing this glorious and awesome name of the Lord your God. See, We've got to, when we approach the Word of God, we've got to diligently observe it. We need to obey it, and that's part of the fear of God. Obedience in His Word is tied to fear here. And so fearing His name, which is the Lord, the the Lord is the I am that I am that we talked about last week. And so uh, one is we have to... to, um, love and value the word of God, but two, we need to pursue obedience and holiness. And what do I mean by this? We need to pursue obedience. Yes, we are saved by grace. Um, There's nothing we can do to make us more right with God, but we do need to pursue holiness and obedience. Proverbs 8.13 says this, to fear the Lord is to hate evil. See, a lot of people have confusion about what does the fear of, uh, of the Lord do? Well, one of the things is, is um, it helps us to know what God likes and what God doesn't like and how we need to view those things. It is a, uh, a foundation of our values. It is a, it is a foundation of truth. So um, when, when you get the fear of the Lord, you begin to get worked up about what God gets worked up about. You begin to um, be concerned about your own sin and not just the sins of others, not just, you know, playing plank spec in other people's eyes. That's not what God has ever called us to, is picking out other people's sins. He has called us to have the fear of God ourselves. When you have the fear of God, your sin and evil bothers you greatly. That is the fear of God. That's that's how God helps deliver us from sin because our heart's desires begin to be His. You know know how you know that you're fearing God more? You're, You're loving the things that God loves and you're hating evil that God hates. It says... Uh, in Proverbs 16, 6, it says this, By steadfast love and faithfulness, iniquity is atoned for, and by the fear of the Lord, one turns away from evil. It is the fear of the Lord that helps us turn away from sin. And so we cultivate that. We cultivate it by, by valuing and, and being in His Word, by pursuing the fear of God to obey, obey what He says, no matter if it's comfortable or not. If he tells you to do something, do it. And it is in that obedience that we learn to to, um, turn away 
from the things that God doesn't want us involved in. It says this in 2 Corinthians 7, 1, Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and of spirit, making holiness perfect in the fear of God. See, the fear of God is involved in us living right. And so that's why we pursue this. So Jesus, when he was living here, when he was tempted in the same manners and ways that we are tempted, what did he do? He went to the word of God. He quoted back the word of God to the tempter. And he obeyed. He focused on obedience. It says he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. And so we are to do the same thing. Obedience is not just self-driven or tradition-driven holiness. Uh, Fear of the Lord is is when God himself leads you to say, that's not right in your life right now, Tweed, or your name. That's when when that thing changes in our lives. Um, Anyway, the third thing is we need to cultivate and guard our hearts. Cultivate and guard your hearts. Why is being in the Word important? Why is being a part of a church family important? Because those are key tools to guard and cultivate our hearts. Look what it says in Jeremiah 32, 39. It says, I will give them one heart. This is a prophecy of the new covenant. I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for their own good and the good of their children after them. Fear of God, first of all, um, is, is the fear that God wants us to live in. Not in fear of this and fear of that and what if, what if this happens and fear of pain and suffering. Um, we deserve death. We will all die. We are all destined to die because sin, or, sin entered in. But... If we fear Him and trust Him for, for um, His way, then it's even going to benefit our families and our children. We need to cultivate and guard our heart. Notice that it says, I will give them one heart. See, fear of God is a heart issue. It is a heart issue. Not just a religiosity issue that you're more strict or rigid. No. Proverbs 4.23 says this, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows out from it. The fear of God is the very thing that changes our hearts. As we begin to see a correct view of His power and His wisdom and His his love, uh, that begins to change us. We begin to see Him in His true light. We begin to see ourselves in the true light. And a couple, couple more things. How do we live in the fear of God? The reality is we treat people like Jesus treated them. In Nehemiah chapter 5, verse 15, I know this is an Old Testament story, but I love the illustration it gives. It says, but, but the earlier governors who preceded me uh, placed a heavy burden on the people and took 40 shekels of silver from them in addition to food and wine. And their assistants also lorded it over the people. So he's talking about lords and them taxing the people and and all those things. And he says, but out of reverence for God, I did not act that way. So he's a great example. Uh, Nehemiah is a type of Christ, in fact. And, And so out of reverence for God, I didn't act like that. I'm not the new kind of Lord that lives selfishly upon its subjects. He's, we treat people the way Jesus treated them. He says, I did not come to be served, but to serve. We love people. Um, Leviticus 19.14 says this, Do not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block in front of the blind, but fear your God, I am the Lord. This, is, this verse directly relates to how we treat others and how it relates to the fear of God. Do you fear God? Do you put stumbling blocks in front of people? Do you care about the outcasts in our culture and our world? How we treat others is how we treat God. And so we need to be treating others well. 
Um, not, not worrying about what fears that we're fearful of and what we might be losing, but we need to love people. If we're rude with people, we're rude with God. If we give to others, we're giving to God. Um, two last points. Invest in the future, not the present. Jesus always had the end in mind. He always knew it wasn't just about the present. Even when he was meeting the needs in the present, he was always thinking about the future. So when he multiplied um, the loaves and fishes, he was meeting their immediate needs. But he's also pointing to the reality of ultimate satisfaction and ultimate hunger and ultimate thirst that we talked about uh, last week. And so we always invest in, in the future, not just the present. Verse uh, Psalm 34, 9 says, Fear the Lord, you His holy people, for those who fear Him lack nothing. Just like Jesus said, Seek first my kingdom and my righteousness, and all these things will be added. Even in the Old Testament in Psalms 34, Fear the Lord, and you won't lack for anything. Don't Focus just on the immediate need. Focus on fearing God and the future and our relationship there and all those things. You know, storing up uh, treasures is one of those ways we don't um, fear God. By, by being a consumer and not a contributor and a participant. Leaving a heritage and not just focusing on your own past. See, you have a past that God allowed you in to strengthen you and to make you who you are, and you're to be investing that forward, paying it forward. Live as if God is the, the real source and provider of all things. And then finally, take refuge in Him. Here's where, if, if today you struggle with fear, I want to tell you the, the biggest way to deal with fear is to focus on the, the fear that um, rules them all. Fearing God. As you, if you place yourself in the hands of God that controls all things, all these other minor, lesser fears can no longer control you. Now that's a practical thing, and I know we have to live that out, and it's hard. So, so what do we do? We need to take refuge in Him. Notice what it says in Psalms 31, 19. Oh, how abundant is your goodness, which you have stored up, for those who fear you and worked for those who take refuge in you in sight of the children of mankind. See, God stores up goodness and kindness for those who fear Him and those who take refuge in Him. There are times where we are fearful. And so what do you do when you're fearful? You take refuge in Him. You take refuge in Him. You know, in, in, in the, uh, the book, 1984, which is very appropriate these days, if you think about it. If you haven't read it, I encourage you to do that. But in the book, there's a, a Room 101. And in Room 101, it contains uh, a, a person's greatest fears. It contains their greatest fears. It's that, well, that one thing that absolutely is unbearable for them to endure. And so uh, the specifics of that fear or that room 101 is different for each person. But the party um, uses this fear to infiltrate a person's mind and to completely break them down psychologically. And once they have been broken, they're re-educated. Uh, their re-education can be completed by Big Brother. I want to just tell you that that's how our culture works. Fear-mongering is to get, go after your, your greatest fears, those things that you don't think you could endure. And the purpose is, is to break you down psychologically so that you are re-educated and become formed into the things of this world. Don't follow the conspiracies of this world. Follow Jesus. See, we don't need a big brother. We have a big father in heaven. And he says, 
The beginning of wisdom is the fear of me, understanding me, taking me serious. I am your creator. I am the one that designed you. Trust me, follow me, obey me, get to know me in the word, understand my grace and my forgiveness. And all of that flows through the fear of God. And so I want to just conclude with this. If you don't have a relationship with God, today's the day. You know, God is is all about love and grace. But the reality is if you don't receive his love and grace, there is a great fear ahead. You don't want to be on the other side of God's judgment. You want to be on Jesus' side because he's paid the penalty of judgment. So I just invite you, if you're filled with fear, I want to tell you there's one fear that rules them all, and that's fearing God, trusting him, taking him seriously, getting to know him, living for him. I invite you today, commit your life to Jesus. For those of you who are uh, struggling with significant fear, I want to pray for you as we close. Lord, we just thank you that you are a God that overcomes fear. And so, God, if there are people uh, watching and listening that uh, are, are being hindered with great levels of fear and anxiety, even phobias, Lord, I pray for healing and grace and mercy to happen in each of their lives, Lord. Lord, that they would begin as they cling to you and as they trust you, as they take refuge in you, that they would recognize those fears are small in comparison to you. So Lord, just bring deliverance to those who are filled with fear these days. Lord, we trust you. We call upon you in this chaotic world. Lord, um, if it be your will, Maranatha, come, Lord, quickly. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Man, God bless you, church. And I just want to um, conclude with this. September, we are starting our At The Movies series. And so you don't want to miss. We're going to be watching uh, uh, clips from, from popular movies, maybe ones you love. Hopefully you've seen them all. And, and we're going to see the story of God. We're going to see messages of truth that God um, uh somehow communicates through these films and through these artists and um, how it lines up with scripture. And so I just encourage you, this is a great time to bring your friends and your family um, in September uh, at the movies. God bless and have a great week.